Hey everybody, how are you all doing today? Yeah, that's great, love to hear it. Come on, we can be a little more enthusiastic, right? All right, that's awesome. So right now, I'm gonna ask you guys to um, turn off all your flashes on your uh, camera phones and uh, cameras if we could, please, just no flash photography. Uh, but please take as many photos as you like. We'd love to see those up on you know, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. Uh, next, if you could turn your phones off or uh, put them on vibrate or mute. And if you do happen to get a phone call, if you just mind taking it out in the hallway there. Uh, next, I'd like to point out that we have a microphone here in the middle. So if you guys have questions for these folks and you know they start taking questions, please go up to the mic and use it. We'd love to hear those questions. And then lastly, we're doing something called flipon.tv right now. So we're actually uh, streaming live right now as we speak, not only with this panel, but all of the panels going on right now. If you actually look towards the back, you'll see a camera going on. So it's really exciting to see that. So I'm gonna step off the stage here and let Eric uh, start up here. Yeah, Have a good day, you guys. Hey, everybody, thanks for coming out. Um, we're, we're gonna start, Joe. <laughs> um, we, we have a lot of great folks with us today uh, to talk about uh, some of the sci-fi comics we've been doing. Um, sci-fi can be a lot of different things, everything from uh, faraway worlds to futuristic worlds to uh, worlds that are a lot like our own with kind of a, a few twists and turns. Um, and the folks that we've got doing stuff at Image right now are some of the best in the business. And uh, uh, I'm gonna start with, uh, we have Fiona Staples. And she does Saga, as you, as you may know. And uh, we also have uh, Duffy Boudreau, who does Blackacre. <laughs> also with us is uh, Curtis Weeb and Riley Rosmo, who have, uh, uh, did a great book for us called Debris. Uh, we, we have the wonderful Brandon Graham. Uh, Richard Starkings. And, and it's a real pleasure to have with us today uh, a special guest, uh, Greg Rucka, who is doing a new book for us called Lazarus. Yeah, that's our cover. That's, yeah, that's, 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 that's the issue one cover. And uh, Greg actually has to, to take yeah. off in a bit, so we're gonna jump right into him. And uh, we're gonna show you some pages now that are, this is actually the, the, the first artwork anyone has seen uh, for Lazarus. And uh, Greg, why don't you kind of kind of walk us through this? Well, we, we came up with, with this idea because uh, previews very kindly will give you four pages to do, you know, teaser art and so on. And Michael and I were talking about that and we were like, you know what, we don't want to take four disparate pages. What we wanted to do was tell a story. So we wrote uh, and, and Michael drew this four page short short that will be in the April issue of previous? Yeah, yeah, it'll be the one that's on sale at the end of this month. Yeah, this is, and this is the issue that solicits the first, uh, the first issue of Lazarus. So we did this little four pager that introduces our world and our main character forever, who is the young woman who is murdering people mercilessly at the top of that page. Um, and then that's her daddy um, talking to basically the man who designed her. Um, and it's just it's short and sweet and to the point. Michael and I are gonna, and, and Image will have this, uh, this up as a PDF as of Monday, and I'm gonna have it up and available through my Tumblr and the website so people can download it and check it out. Um, but we, we just wanted to do something a little different and we wanted to introduce people to the concept and like I said, we wanted to, I. I I wanted a narrative. I wanted something that had a beginning, a middle, and an end. So it's four pages, and it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and hopefully will entice you all to try issue one when it goes on sale at the end of June. So, and oh, and I should add, uh, Michael Lark is doing the coloring and inking. Colors are by Santiago, uh, I always pronounce his last name in, uh, incorrectly. I believe it's Arcas. Uh, who is a, a Spaniard of great talent that I had the honor of working with um, when I was writing Checkmate for DC many, many years ago. He did the initial coloring on that book, and I always, always loved what he did. So uh, we're fortunate to have him. 
Uh, now, Greg, this, this takes place in kind of the near yeah. future. Uh, yeah, the, so the quick overview, everybody's like, great, that's a four page short short. What's it about? Uh, well, it's about a woman who kills people, God, no. Um, it's, the, the, the shorthand I've been using for it is to call it, it's sort of children of men meets the godfather, um, which is great if you're writing a studio log line, but really horrible if you're trying to convince people it's something they should pick up, unless they're really curious or big fans of either of those movies. Um, it's a near future dystopia. It basically came out of me spending way too much time thinking about the Occupy movement and what happens when a 99% becomes a 99.9999% and the 1% becomes 0 .00001%. When, when wealth becomes so concentrated uh, and, and that gap becomes so big, you revert I posit, to a sort of feudal state. So it is a world that is an indeterminate distance from our own, and it is a world that has been pretty much divvied up amongst some 20 to 30 families. And these are ruling families. These are families that have the concentrated wealth. And what they've done is they have basically rendered government uh, inconsequential, and they rule huge domains, and if you are proven to be of service or of use to the family in some fashion, you are educated and cared for and you are basically a serf. And if you're not, you're a peasant uh, and you're referred to as waste. Um, it's not a real pretty world. And forever is the Lazarus of the Carlisle family and it is a position in each family that is responsible for sort of defense of the realm but primarily for defense of the family against the other families because when you have that much wealth and you have that much power, you have to guard against people trying to take it. Um, and each family has resources and each family has to compensate for resources they don't. So for instance, a family that does not have access to petroleum refineries cannot be using combustion engines. They've got to have adapted to use either solar or nuclear or hydro or alternatives. The Carlisle family made its money uh, from genetics. They genetically modify crops, they control uh, all those things and they have no qualms about genetically modifying themselves. Um, so for instance, Forever's dad uh, is 110 uh, but looks a rather elegant, say late 60s at the most. Uh, Forever is referred to as a daughter, but part of what the overall story is is she's not their biological daughter. She was quite literally made for a purpose. Um, this gives her certain abilities, and it comes with uh, an enormous price. So, There's a very long explanation. It's going to be really good, and Michael is doing some of the best work of his career, hands down. It's beautiful. It is definitely a rated M book. This is not a kitty book. Um, these people are depraved. Um, and there's violence, yes. So there you go. Cool. Do you, do you need to? Yeah, and now I got to go. And Thank and you very much. I really, <laughs> please check it out. We are so proud of this book. And like I said, all this stuff's going to be up online, and you'll be able to take a look at it and talk about it. And, you know, once we have the order code, I promise you, I'll, I'll make sure you know it. So Great thanks, guys. Everybody. Thank you, everybody. Next up, we are going to talk with uh, you, Joe, because uh, Joe does a fantastic book uh, called Great Pacific, which also that 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 is kind of like a, a bizarre version of our of our current timeline, correct? Yeah, I guess so. It, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Great Pacific is my sci-fi uh, book about the Great Pacific garbage patch. If you're not familiar, it's a environmental disaster in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, not quite as uh, contiguous and solid as we depict it in the book, but it is uh, this mess of plastic and junk uh, trapped in, in between some ocean currents, and scientists estimate it's about twice the size of the state of Texas. Um, and this book is about this uh, oil heir who essentially throws away his life of privilege and inheritance to uh, go out to this floating continent of trash where he plants a flag and declares it his own sovereign nation. 
Um, yeah, can, can everybody see that okay, or is it too bright in here? It is bright. bright isn't it? Hey, can you guys maybe bring the lights down a little bit? Anyway, go on. <laughs> it's a lovely night scene, and yeah, it should be too easy. Um, yeah, so and then it's about this uh, this guy's essentially he's having to deal with all these unexpected threats. He's, he finds himself quickly uh, in over his head. Um, he made a mess out the door, so he's a fugitive, so he's going to be hunted uh, by the authorities uh, from the United States because he, uh, he ended up embezzling billions of dollars out of the company his family founded and, and operates, one of the largest oil companies in the world. What's that, um, what's that uh, was it Sealandia or something, the, the country where the it, guy it, took Well, Sealand is a micro nation. Sealand, that yeah. I, yeah, I did a lot of research on that. Because that place is so fascinating. It's like a, what is it, a... a a World War II platform that a yeah, guy it's just like an took oil spill over. An oil, an, an, yeah, an abandoned oil. Yeah, kind platform. of, kind of like your story where, it, where it. Um, that's awesome. You're doing. Got to read that because well, that was it's, always it's fascinating. This I, well, it, you know, the book takes you know follows a couple of tracks. One, it's a survival story set in this really bleak sci-fi environment. Uh, he's got to deal with mutated marine life. Uh, we've had this really monstrous uh, mutant octopus that showed up already. We've had uh, seagulls and, and with who two are these heads. Guys? These are well. I'm, these are. Uh, we're going to learn more about them in issue five that comes out next week, right? Yeah. And uh, these are uh, uh, people who are indigenous to a nearby atoll. And, um, you know, there's a history of colonization in this area. This is where, you know, the Japanese dominated and then the Americans freed a lot of people in this area from the Japanese. And then, you know, the Americans did a lot of atomic testing in this area as well. So there's a there's a, it, it's been the setting for a lot of, for such a beautiful tropical place, it's been the setting of a, you know, a lot of crap that's going on here. And uh, yeah, so what else do we got up there? That's it? Yep. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to move on to you, Duffy. And uh, Duffy does a book called Black Acre. Okay, hey guys, this is my first panel, so bear with me, please. Um, first time ever. So. Okay, so Black Acre is a uh, dy dystopian book uh, set in uh, 20 the 22nd century America, uh, post-economic collapse, and it's the story of one soldier's involvement in this clandestine operation, which eventually leads to the downfall of this very powerful city-state. Um, so it kind of, the story shifts back and forth between two worlds. On one side, you have this, um, um, this totally opulent, um, socially engineered isolationist um, kind of fortress in the mountains started by the elites of our day um, to ensure their future kind of when the rest of the country gets shuttered. And, um, and then on the other side of the wall, and that's, that's split up into like three classes. You have like the guardians, a small elite group of families. You have um, the, this big military class that's raised communally. And then you have a big part of the citizenry who have reduced rights. Um, so it's essentially just a big fortress with a very, very expensive private security apparatus. Um, and then outside the wall, it's basically a lawless frontier, um, but uh, there's been no environmental destruction. So you have a lot of these same, uh, you, you get some of the, the similar dynamics that you get from post-apocalyptic stories, but with no environmental destruction. So it's this massive wilderness with, um, you know, where people have kind of reverted back to their worst tribal instincts. Um, so it's like the Wild West up. It is. It's, it's, it's actually kind of worse than the Wild West. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, there are different there are different variations and iterations wild of. Wild West. <laughs> it is not the Wild Wild West. No, it's not. <laughs> but uh, up here, you see. Yeah, this is uh, the main character. Uh, one of the main, uh, this security uh, officer Hull, and uh, it, this is supposed to be just a little example of like the shoot on site policy that they have. So anyone that lives outside of this city. If they enter this area, this kind of buffer area outside, it, um, right on the perimeter of the city, they're just shot on sight, no questions, um, and that is how they do things. Now, and you're you're just getting to the end of your first arc on the book, and, and like like what do you have planned for what's coming up? Uh, well, we have um, the arcs wrapping up, and that kind of the first arc is all about Hull's um, involvement in this operation that takes him outside of the walls. And um, he's just thrown all about, and then he'll, at, at the end of issue five, he'll be situated in this new life, and the second arc will um, kind of expand on what, or it will actually, it's, a, it's kind of a new thing. It will show him trying to deal with this complete 
completely new existence he never thought he'd ever experience. Wait, is this in Hull? Hull. H U L L. Yeah. No, it's not uh, not Hull. Like no, hole in no a it wasn't. It's not product <laughs> branding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. So yeah. Um, so that is in uh, issue six gonna, is going to come out the same day as the trade, uh, May first. Um, so um, yeah. That's great. Is the doctor who's going to call me like? <laughs> not, knock it off, Brandon. Uh, <laughs> Before, uh, uh, before Curtis uh, uh, started enjoying success on Peter Panzerfaust and Riley on uh, Bedlam, uh, they, 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 they did a great book for us called Debris. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Curtis? Uh, Debris is, it was a four issue miniseries uh, we did this summer, uh, last summer. And uh, basically it's, it's set in, uh, again, a dystopian future. Uh, we kind of wanted to experiment a little bit. A lot of the times, like the dystopian futures are very bleak and dark and gray. Uh, but we got uh, this color scheme, Owen Jenny on it. Yeah, and I, I want to do something fun, like <laughs> fun, not, you know, horrible violence. Yeah, we we just kind of wrapped Green Wake, and Riley was like, let's change it up a bit. You mean it, as opposed to horrible violence, we're doing fun violence? Yes. Yeah, okay. hor yeah. Horrible fun violence. <laughs> Smushing that kittens. Like the stuff getting get ripped off there, so. Yeah, but it plays robots, so it's okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so basically, it's yeah, it's set in the in a in the future on Earth. And uh, this tribe uh, that lives out in the middle of this wasteland, and it's just, it's garbage for like infinite, infinite miles. And um, there's these things called colossals, which is that giant snake creature that uh, they roam this, this countryside of this wasteland. And uh, Maya, who's the main character, she's been training for a long time to become this new protector of her tribe. And um, here she's obviously encountered one of the colossals, which are very dangerous. And it, Basically, in the first issue, what happens is the, the creature finds their tribe, and uh, before being killed, it destroys their source of water. And Maya is then taking the role of protector, and she has to leave her family and her, her tribe and go out and find the last source of water in the world, which is a myth. Nobody actually believes it, it exists because they just believe garbage is everywhere. Um, and so it's just like a little kind of adventure story that you know she goes off and Come tries to find it. Coming in yeah. story, environmental themes. Now, and this is out in trade now, right? Yep. Yeah, yep. yeah, it's out in trade. And it's actually pretty inspired by um, a Haida mythology. There was this uh, chief that lived like 50 years ago, and the quote was that basically in the future there is this one place of land that his tribe was settled near, and he said in the future that all the nations of the world would war over this final source of water, and I really like that quote, and that was the major inspiration for the story. Okay, so we, we, we've, we've got garbage and garbage yeah. and class struggles and dystopian futures, and, uh, uh, and then, Brennan, what, what, what is profit? Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful Rob LaFeld comment. Thank you for asking. LaFeld, that's how we're pronouncing that now? I've, you know, I've never met him. I, I, I call him Rob, we're pretty tight. Okay. Um, yeah, um, well, this crazy person uh, named Eric Stevenson at one point asked me to to take this the ridiculous superhero comic from the 90s and uh, and reboot it and, and make I, it a ridiculous comic for it's it's pretty ridiculous it's like it's because it's set the original prophet was set in world war ii and is um basically liefeld wanting to do liefeld liefeld, liefeld? Right, yeah. okay it's basically him wanting to do um <laughs> it was it's like him doing a he, he compared the, uh, the him reading the bible as a child to superhero comics and so he was like this is a biblical superhero comic there is a lot of fun violence in the Bible. So. Yeah, 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 so it's, um, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a bizarre comic book, and, um, and I, I never grew up on, on superhero comics as much as, um, like, heavy metal and science fiction and everything, so I uh, kind of turned it into this, I, I, the idea of this, this super soldier clone thing, and so we set it way, way in the future, 10,000 years in the future after humanity is essentially extinct, but these clones still exist. And so it's about this raising of this clone army again and another clone kind of stopping and this kind of um, trying to trying to set science fiction beyond humanity and show kind of the universe advancing beyond humanity, but, but this kind of colonial uh, army still, still going forward and, and them being kind of a damaging thing, but, but still trying to show the characters as, uh, it's Space Conan, I don't know. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and, and, and so we've got this. This, this is from an issue that you drew, and, and actually, uh, Brandon has a lot of fantastic collaborators with him on the book. Simon Roy, uh, Yannis, Yanni, yeah. um, 
Uh, Farrell Dalrymple. Farrell Dalrymple. Uh, Joseph Bergen. There's, yeah. Um, and, 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 and then also Brandon. If, if, if you're not familiar with his work, he also he, he did a fantastic book called King City. And he's currently doing a book for us also called uh, Multiple Warheads. And he, he, he is a fantastic artist himself. Well, thank you. But yeah, so this one, because I'd, I'd made notes originally about the science fiction. I'd explain this thing because Prophet is just Conan Space is my thing. And then I'm like, read this like impenetrable nonsense, please. And uh, this was uh, this was me thinking about how you know when you're drawing a comic, because because both writing and drawing for other people and for myself, it's dramatically different to work on something. Because it's something that really I gain from drawing my own stuff when I work on it. Is say like this is a city where a robot's looking for. He's a robot that that eats and grows as he as he goes. So he can he can grow f larger or grow new tools or arms by just eating matter, and um, and he senses there's another robot like him on this alien planet that he wakes up on. And um, this is him going to find it. And that alien has been, has been uh, captured by these, or the, that robot's been captured by the alien uh, bird people here on this planet. And they've turned him into kind of this power source for his whole thing. And so just drawing the city and doing all the details of, of the pipes and how it works and, and the different suburbs and how we're just kind of thinking about the, the class system and whatever in a city is a really fun way to spend an afternoon and, and really delve deep into this, in the science fiction of it in a way where you're, you know, if you're if you're sitting there in front of the page for 12 hours, you're going to think a lot about where your story is going, which is right. which is nice. Mm. Um, what have we got here? This is uh, this is the robot going up to this thing. They, to to deal with really vast science fiction distances, essentially, um, basically like space travel has to work like time travel if you're going across large enough distances because any place you get to, you would die of old age, any reasonable method, going speed of light or anything. So they have this thing called the Cyclops Rail, which is essentially man-made wormhole so that, uh, that you go through. And, and because they mess with time, sometimes you end up before you, you left, and sometimes you end up like after you left you know, by years. And, and this is an anchor point for the Cyclops Rail, which is a, uh, a planet that they moved with it. It's all these gigantic, ridiculous science fiction ideas, and me and my friends that work on it just having a blast. And it makes it hard to describe and not sound like a crazy person. <laughs> this is from my Multiple Warhead series, which is essentially like a fictional version of Russia with a fantasy story about these organ smugglers that, um, that take magical organs. And uh, it's, it's really just me meandering through it's this science fiction environment and just trying to show all the little details. And something I really enjoy when I when I read comics or watch movies is you'll see a bookshelf in the background of some like, you know, science fiction lab and you're like, I wanna see all the books on that. But if, if you're drawing it, you can actually be like, let's show you what the books on the bookshelf are like. And it's like, it's like doing fan fiction of your own work or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this one is like, uh, something I really enjoy doing is trying to come up with like kind of utilitarian things within the comics that would be fun to draw. And this one, um, I, I'm always fascinated, I'm a little too fascinated with how people in different environments like use the bathroom. Like in Profit, I, I haven't put it in the book, but I'm just like, how, or how do the bathrooms work on their spaceship? And um, they, this ship eats in these troughs, but. Um. So there's gonna be a whole <laughs> upcoming issue about that? Right, so this thing is, uh, there's actually, yeah, there's, but it's a poop joke in a recent issue. But, uh, so this one is basically, that booklet on top is a, uh, it's toilet paper but you know, it's like thin paper, but printed on it is survival tips. So if you're out in the wilderness, it can be like, this is how you deal with the snake bite. And you're like, cool, and then you use it to wipe with as well. <laughs> so it's just coming up with fun ideas again. And I'm, I, I, I do a lot of puns because I'm trying to get people to hate me. And, uh, and the, all the chapters in this are alphabetical. So this says chapter, it was up to chapter M, and so this is chapter NMLP, and then smaller there it says pee on a mountain, and then she's peeing on a pipe actually. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's another page. Um, Richard Starkins has been uh, uh, doing Elephant Men for, for several years for us now. It's, it's, we're going on like eight years, right? Yep. Is it 2006? Yep. yep. Which in, 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 in uh, Elephant Men is born out of, a, out of a, some series that Richard published himself so originally called Hip Flask, and the, the newest of which just came out. Um, and uh, it, it's a crazy world. It is a crazy world. This is, um, those by the way are chocolate covered strawberries, not beef burgers. Uh, and this is the cover of issue 50. We're up to issue 50, actually past issue 50 because we did some one shots too. And that's uh, a variant cover for issue 50 by Frank Quietly. 
also on a T-shirt. Um, and um, who's Red Elephant then? Okay, thank you. So they're you know human animal hybrids designed to be super soldiers in a war between Africa and China, but they've been defeated, rehabilitated, and now they live amongst us. And on Brandon's cover here, my dystopian world actually has a blue sky and uh, the character's drinking tea and eating sushi, so it's not that dystopian. <laughs> but um, It's a happy dystopia. You know, for me, um, you know, like Brandon, I grew up, I preferred science fiction. I grew up on 2000 AD and uh, heavy metal and Mobius and... Um, you know, I always felt like superheroes started out as science fiction and then became something else, but I loved the Fantastic Four and I loved big characters and big ideas, which I think Fantastic Four was always full of. Um, so uh, that's what I've been doing. It's sort of a... They're not superheroes. This is uh, Gabatha, who's, uh, like me, is a Buddhist. Uh, this is a cover by Boo Cook from issue 48 in which Gabatha may or may not die. Um, and uh, actually, if you go to, yeah, there we go. This is the elephant men on Mars because I wanted to put the elephant men on Mars. <laughs> so, and, and you know, even though I think when you do a science fiction comic, you're sort of bound to tackle big ideas. Um, what I always liked about the Fantastic Four and, and books like that was that they went from a sort of family feeling where they were getting on with their lives and then suddenly they were in the negative zone. So suddenly the Elephant Men, issue 47, they're on the moon and issue 49, they're on Mars and then issue 50, they go to an art gallery. <laughs> True story. Is now, there another in terms of uh, moving around to, to lots of different worlds, that is a, that, that, that is a big part of a, a book that we do called Saga by Brian K. Vaughan and Jonas Gable. And you guys have really created a, a, a pretty vast, I mean, I mean we're, we're not just talking about a couple of planets, we're, we're all over the place uh, at this yeah, point. Yeah, the entire universe, really. Um, Saga is sort of a space opera in the vein of Flash Gordon or Star Wars. Um, it's about this galaxy that's sort of been torn apart by this massive war that's been going on forever between a planet landfall and its only moon, Reef. And our main characters are two soldiers from opposite sides that decide to desert their respective armies and just run off together and have a child. Um, and they spend the first, the first arc, our first six issues, looking for a way off the planet that they start out on, the planet Cleave. Um, this monkey mechanic, grease monkey, uh, has given them a treasure map to the legendary rocket ship forest. So they're trying to make their way across the planet while the, both of their armies and all these assassins and bounty hunters and robots are after them, uh, trying to follow their map to get to the rocket ship forest. And by the end of the first arc, they found it, they've blasted off into space, and now they have the entire universe at their disposal, basically. So, and, and, and these aren't just any rocket ships. These, these are it, it, it. Very much is a rocket ship forest. So. Yeah. So our rocket ship is a tree, and <laughs> um, even though Saga uses a lot of the familiar tropes of sci-fi, like rocket ships and lasers and stuff and robots, um, I feel like it falls a little bit more into the realm of fantasy, mm. and. I can tell based on the amount of research that Brian and I do, which is basically none, but it's more <laughs> a fantasy book. <laughs> we just make everything up, more or less. <laughs> There's very little science involved in Saga, but in the, in the looser definition of the term, it's sort of sci-fi. <laughs> now, and, they, and, and, and Mark and Alana have encountered some, some strange things over the course of the series, but when we did a panel the other day, uh, there, there was a little bit of discussion of, of this particular strange thing that everyone wanted to know about. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Oh, that's, that was Brian's idea. He was oh, I love that. It was, it was in the script. I didn't just pull that out of nowhere. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's one of the many hostile creatures that they encounter in their travels. Oh, he's a bad guy. <laughs> well, <laughs> he's not nice. <laughs> that guy looks nuts. <laughs> he's angry about, I don't know, his situation. 
His name is Bard, by the way. He lives on a gigantic uh, orb that may or may not be a planet. Might be. Did you anyway. <laughs> for that? I did. I did. That is one thing that I research. That's um, something you just Google it. I did. Like yeah. It's. It was really awful. <laughs> if you do a Google image search for scrotum, you don't come up with any normal images of like nice shapely scrotums. You just get all the horrible like medical disasters. Let's put nice scrotums in. <laughs> yeah, could, could you just enter in nice shapely scrotum and maybe that would have been? Yeah. All that, that was I mean, really that's what kind I was of not what you were looking though. for, yeah. but yeah. We're, we're going to move away from that image, just so then we're going we're gonna, <laughs> to... So it's nice to know where you stand, though. <laughs> yeah, we're just, we're just going to talk about general stuff, and we're going to start with you, Fiona, because you, you mentioned that you and Brian don't... Like, like you're not doing a, a whole bunch of research. You're, you're basically creating everything. And, and one of the great things about, about sci-fi and, and fantasy comics is you can kind of, like, build an entire world. Mm -hmm. And how, how much... And, and this... Everyone can kind of chime in on this after Fiona answers, but... Uh, like, 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 what kind of discussion did you and Brian have going into it in terms of like how you wanted to map out the the world of Saga? Um, well, we haven't really done too much world building just for the sake of world building. Uh, everything that we come across is very much tied into the plot. Like, we're mm -hmm. just following our characters, and um, I don't know where the story is going. And so our universe just sort of starts with Mark and Alana in their planet of origin, and then stands out we're like designing it as we go along basically um to start out with we just did a, a few basic character designs and i did some some settings like some ideas for the worlds that we were gonna spend the most time on but other than that it's sort of flying by the seat of our pants i guess right <laughs> how about you richard um I've spent 50 issues building the world, and you know, oftentimes there's something that I thought I would get to in three issues that took me 33 issues to get to because, you know, when, you know, I, I'm following characters too, and you know, one of the most frustrating things about characters is, is that when they won't go where you want them to go, or they won't do what you want them to do, and they won't show you what you want to show. So, um, you know, I think. You know, when you're exploring ideas, and, and you know, it, it, the, the world I've created is, it's, it's hard to create a future world that is science fiction because oftentimes, you know, I work with many different artists and, um, you know, they'll draw a brick wall or they'll draw a cell phone 200 years in the future. And you have to sort of constantly think, well, that's, that's dated now. A cell phone is dated now. So, um, you know, I often see things, Marion was very good, Marion Churchill was very good at sort of, she we actually call it, I refer to it as Marion Tech. Yeah, when she was working on it, she was actually looking through some of the reference and she was like, wires, wires wouldn't exist in the future. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you have to, um, you cheat a little bit because you want it to feel real, but you want to outthink the present. Um, luckily, you know, I have human-animal hybrids walking around uh, diverting your attention, but um, I think that you know when you are um, building a world, it's sort of your responsibility to show as much of it as you can and um, outthink your readers um, because your readers will try to outthink you. You know. Anybody else? I think, like with with sci-fi and science fiction. You just kind of do a, a bait and switch. That you're like, oh, it's it's sciency because there's robots. Like debris was <laughs> was about giant monsters, really, and then I just made them have robot stuff on them. <laughs> and it's it, you know the world the world sort of starts building itself from that, and you have like a robot snake, and then you're like, well, I like werewolves, <laughs> so I'm gonna make werewolves, but they're robots, so it's science fiction. Now, and, and Joe, I mean, for you, because of what you're doing, you, you've done actually a, a tremendous amount of research just about on, on, on the, the garbage patch. And yeah, yeah, I mean, I, it is a real thing, but we also make a big departure point after we, you know, after we, after we pretty much present what it is, the, the actual Great Pacific Garbage Patch doesn't look like that. It's not, 
it, you know, we created this world with its own uh, geography, its own, um, there, there'll, there'll be flat plains in some areas of it, there'll be these uh, soaring mountains and others, and uh, there's a lot to explore. We wanted to make this very varied world, so the science fiction really comes into play in that departure. Um, uh, you know, whenever there's a news story about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, I get about 30 emails from people every day, like, have you seen this? I'm like, yes, I've seen that, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> it just starts pinging all day long. But uh, it's, it's a departure, I mean, the, the they're killing someone over in the next room. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So are you talking he about really, it, uh, he really doesn't like that you stop researching. Yeah, I know. I'll go really back. <laughs> I'll. So it's on my something, email list. something I really enjoy about science fiction is I, I sometimes I work on this thing where I, I on a level I think of as art therapy, where I'm basically trying to write about my own life through the work, and science fiction is a really blatant way to talk about it in extreme ways and also disguise it at the same time. Mm. I remember I used to, I hate cell phones, I mean having them because I like to be able to escape from them and not have somebody calling me and I, uh, I, I had a cell phone for a little while and I found the thing so frustrating how much it was interrupting my outdoor life and so um, I remember at the time I did a comic book which is just about a guy who has a cell phone. I had a girlfriend I wasn't getting along with at the time and it had a, he has a cell phone, or he just has a telephone on his crotch. And I've got this, this attack scene where the, he's like guarding a temple and a sumo warrior comes up to fight him. And they're like, all right, let's do this. And then his cell phone, his phone on his crotch rings and he's like, hold on, I gotta take this. And he goes and he's like, I'm sorry, honey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And the guy always walks by him. And that was like me being like, this is how it feels. And so science fiction, like I said, just, it's nice and blatant. We're gonna open it up to questions, folks. So uh, we got a microphone here in the middle of the room and uh, I think Richard has some uh, freebies. Uh, some freebies for people who ask questions. So uh, okay, if, if, if you want to jump up there and ask some questions, that would be uh, a, a much more productive way of doing this than not. Eric, do you, can I say something real quick while they're lining up? No. Uh, that, <laughs> no what? Uh, uh, one really interesting thing in terms of world building, a problem that we kind of ran into with our book is that um, what do you do when you have a um, main characters living in societies that are completely closed? So they would have a completely different history and have a completely mm. different stories. Uh, they wouldn't know how the world got to be the way it is. I think it's dialogue. Yeah, dialogue. yeah, yeah and, you, and you wouldn't be able to, in any way, naturally place that into the flow of the story. Um, so what we did in our book is that we use the device of a, a lecture that takes place 100 years after the events of the story where people are looking back on, kind of describing the causes of and um, the reasons why the world got to be the way it did. So that was something that, um, that was something we kind of came about as like trying to figure out that problem of dealing with um, the lack of information in those societies and it, wanting to convey one thing to the reader that the characters themselves wouldn't know. Right. Hello. Start. Hi. Um, I kind of had a question for anyone who wants to comment on this that kind of tangents off of the comment where he wrote in about the cell phone and how that's obnoxious. Um, so I was kind of curious because clearly some of you have picked, you know, environmental things or, you know, um, creating a new life and protecting that life, you know, and having to fight for your, you know, personal freedoms and stuff. Did any of you start out with an idea that you kind of wanted to like, you know, say talk about environmental issues or do you think that just kind of developed, it was a, you know, interesting concept to tackle or did you have any like uh, I mean, in, in Great Pacific, I think you can't do something about this subject matter and not obviously have it be environmentally themed, but from, I've taken it as a point of pride that um, it's, uh, we try not to preach. I don't, I don't want to, uh, he's a, our protagonist, uh, he's more an industrialist in, in a sense. I mean, he mostly has good intentions, but he's really not there to clean it up. He's there because he um, thinks he can do something with it, and he thinks his way of doing something with it is, is the right way. Um, so, you know, he's not trying to, we're not trying to make everybody start recycling. I wouldn't, you know, that's, I mean, that'd be great, but that's not the, the point of the book. It's, it's much more complex than that. And uh, I'd rather, you know, not hit the subject matter on the nose. Mm. I didn't know I was writing a book about post-traumatic stress disorder. And I have a lot of readers who are war veterans that tell me I am writing a book about post-traumatic stress disorder. Thank you very much. Cool. Anyone else? 
Hi, I have um, two totally unrelated questions. Um, for Fiona, um, I'm a writer, I'm not an artist at all, but I really appreciated how in back one of the saga issues, you kind of showed us your art process. And I wonder if you know, like among your peers, do you find that that kind of doing the entire digital art, both drawing and coloring all at once is becoming more normal? Or do you still find a lot of people draw and let other people color? Um, I think it's becoming more common uh, as, as digital coloring becomes something that more people can just do themselves at home rather than, you know, more part of the uh, print production process. Um, and I think there are more artists coming from non-comics backgrounds, like other types of illustrators are sort of trying their hand at it, and those people are trained to do full color artwork. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure about it, but I feel like there are more artists that are drawing and coloring it themselves these days. Do you get, do you get any pushback from colorists that you do it yourself? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, not to my face. Well, it's weird. Like, <laughs> I even think I don't let other people color my stuff anymore, for the most part. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Boo did something recently. Yes. Because yeah. he's, he's very good, but for the most part, just to be a snob. Because you, cause you envision, I have a thing where like I can't recolor black and white work I mean for black and white because it just looks weird, it's finished. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But I was thinking it, it's strange because you don't do, one of the reasons I, I might stick to paper so I can draw on coffee shops, but, but you don't have originals too, because that's a big part mm -hmm. of my income is selling off mm -hmm. the pages. Yeah. yeah um, huh. I don't know, I'm lucky enough to be working on a book where I, you know, earn a decent living from it and I don't need to supplement my income by selling originals or anything as much as my art dealer would love me to. <laughs> so, It'd be uh, cool to see the mistakes and be like, look, she's <laughs> yeah. a human being. I just erase them immediately, no worries. Um, but yeah, doing this stuff digitally just speeds up the whole process for me and it's pretty much the only way that I could manage to do a monthly book. I had one more quick question. Uh, speaking of mythology, I, I've always, I've never really heard the, the f um, origin story of Image Comics. I know there's lots of great names involved. Is that a story you guys would be willing to tell? Uh, the, the, the origin of the name or the origin of the company? The origin of the company, all I the artists that, that coming together, the Eric, revolution. The, the I story that I'd never heard before that, that you told me last night about McFarlane, I thought that was interesting. I liked it because it was a pun, but. Did I tell you that story? I, somebody told me that story that, that they, the reasoning, the, the straw that broke the camel's back for McFarlane wanting to leave Marvel was when he wanted to show Spider-Man stabbing Juggernaut in the eye. And they were like, no, you can't show that. And he's like, Juggernaut's unstoppable. How is he gonna, how is he gonna bring him down? And, uh, and he was like, oh, forget this. We're, we, you know, we gotta get together and talk about something. And I love that it's, a, it's an eye that started the eye. <laughs> <laughs> That's the origin. <laughs> That's the origin. No, I, I think that may be somewhat apocryphal, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Next. Yeah, um, I'm a retailer, and I just kind of wanted to say thank you to Image Comics and to all of you, because Image has been far and away our favorite company in the last year. You guys have just been kicking ass. Thank so. you. Cool, thanks. Yeah. And I mean, you know, even, even from the comics being $3, the books being 10 or, you know, 10 for the first volume, 15 for the later, Whereas Marvel, you know, does $20, $25 soft covers, and it's kind of ridiculous. So thank you for making quality comics at a good price, and just, uh, yeah, round of applause, basically. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for selling them. Give me a comic run. Also wanted to say uh, Saga is our best-selling comic, which we're very proud of. Oh, awesome. So. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Hi, I was uh, wondering, you were talking about, um, like, uh, when you're building, you're telling the stories, they're, like, you're just sort of making stuff up. As the stories get longer and bigger, does it become, how do you manage dealing with the own inter the internal logic of the story? You, Carefully. Than else. Yeah, you know, um, uh, one thing that I find um, is that your subconscious is actually dealing with all those issues that you might not think you've got. Uh, an outcome or a resolution or, um, you know, that characters sort of disappear, but then, you know, you need to bring them back and then they come back in exactly the right way. I, th I think actually if you're working hard and if you're really trying to write an entertaining comic book that has an internal logic, the internal logic tells you what is going to happen or how something's going to resolve. Richard, do you set rules at all for yourself in Ultimate? 
Uh, yeah, I think so. I don't sort of write them down, but there's that, you know, I, I definitely try to stay in science fiction rather than fantasy, right. you know. I and I so. wish I didn't sometimes. <laughs> I, uh, in, in Prophet, I, uh, my Simon Roy, who draws some of the stuff, he, he kind of, um, he's very harsh, which is fantastic for me, so I'll send him ideas, and he's kind of, he's much more science-based than me, so he'll write me back, and he'll be like, this is fantasy, this is bullshit, you need to change it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, a lot of rules help for me for, like, just kind of, um, just certain guidelines that you, like, you do and don't do, and, 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 and that works in a lot of elements, like, even a character's dialogue, you can be like, I got a character, and the main thing about his dialogue was, like, uh, he swears a lot, but it's all feces-based. It's kind of ridiculous, <laughs> but it's like he keeps a through line on some things. Yeah. I think we always just Thank said you. if it came down to it, a wizard did it. I think that's what we agreed on. <laughs> that was our science. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, my name's Gio. I have two questions. It's just for anyone on the panel. Uh, first question would be, why are dystopian and uh, post-apocalyptic stories sort of in the zeitgeist right now, which seems to be fairly common, that's one. And then number two, usually everyone that is in this kind of business has uh, something that they grew up, that they loved as a kid, whether it's a movie, a book, a comic book. Um, what would be the one sort of creator that would surprise us that influenced you to where you are right now? Can I answer the first question real quick? 9-11, 9-11. I think. Multiple Warheads started, I, I used to do porn comics for a living, and they were basically like, do whatever you want as long as there's a certain amount of sex in this. And I was living, I was doing it immediately in, in post-11 uh, New York. And so it was, it, it sounds ridiculous because it's about a werewolf with two penises, but it was, it was me doing my porn comic to kind of emotionally live being with that environment where there's checkpoints mm -hmm. and everything. So yeah, I mean, get out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think for, um, uh, I, I, always, I feel like we live in a, an apocalypse-obsessed culture in a lot of ways, um, and there's a lot of variations on that, um, whether it's like peak oil, the rapture, and you're, these, th these are things we're constantly hearing about, and part of the argument in our book is sometimes do you worry, when worrying about these big things falling apart on this grand scale, do we forget about the little things, and there can be this gradual small decay of due, due to neglect. So, and I, I just think it's real. I think it's something that's on everyone's mind because I feel like we're constantly filled with terror in the headlines every day, mm -hmm. and a lot of times it's uh, exaggerated and life will go on. But uh, you know, it's something that I think informs us, informs how we feel about things. So, Joe, what was the question? Have, yeah, about, uh, <laughs> about why we're doing so many dystopian. Uh, well, I mean, the future doesn't look that. Great, does it? I mean, I mean, my book in Great Pacific. Um, I would argue that it's not dystopian because somebody's actually trying to address a problem. I think where it gets a little complicated, if it, you know, goes into that negative place, is is, is in the way our protagonist uh, ends up doing so. Um, you know, one of the big the big ideas that informs this book is that nobody's cleaning up this problem, and in the absence of action on a, on a really big level, it's not going to get cleaned up. And because governments aren't making the effort necessary to clean it up, you have people with their own private ideas that are going to do so. And our protagonist, like I said, is an industrialist. He, he looks at, um, you know, he can see a future dystopia and he tackles it the way he envisions, say, a John D. Rockefeller or a, a Cornelius Vanderbilt might have. Um, and mostly it's for good something, you know, some aspects of it are not as uh, altruistic as some people might expect. Yeah, and then the, the second part of his question uh, was, was do, do any of you guys have any, any surprising influences or, or favorites in terms of the, the things that led you to read or, or make comics? Well, as you know, Eric, I don't shut up about my influences, so I don't know if I could surprise anyone. I, I read a lot of bad furry comics. I don't know. <laughs> Um, Posey Simmons, who does, who did a, a newspaper strip in the Guardian newspaper, I, I, I got to meet her last year, and I reread a lot of her um, strips, and I realized that that I was starting to write l that way. You know that I, I would never have thought that somebody doing a newspaper strip about suburban families would influence the way I write, but it was very clear to me. I, no, go ahead. No, I really like Rob. Maybe it's not a surprise. I really love Ralph Bakshi. 
cartoons, just all Ralph Bakshi cartoons. But I used to really, really cool. I have a, I have a Bakshi story that's very quick. I got to meet him when I was like in my early 20s, and um, he, he was teaching at the SBA, and I, and I walked in, and, um, and I was really excited to meet him because, you know, he's this you know, legendary animator. And he wasn't in the room, and he, and he came in a second, and uh, the first words he said to me was, oh, I just threw my back out in the crapper. And I was like, oh, my God, that's back <laughs> That's funny. Classy. Um, <laughs> it, with regard to science fiction, have you ever come up with anything, and then, you know, a week, a month, a year later, actually you know, seeing the headlines where the thing that you came up with that you were really excited about actually has come to fruition or, you know, a piece of technology that actually exists that you didn't know exists but you thought of it or a, or a scrotum disease that you thought of that, <laughs> you know, actually exists? Well, I think right now, and you, you'll see, for our, our book's about a walled city state and it's about the fears that kind of drive people behind walls. and. You see that kind of popped up in certain places and certain ideas and like movements to revert back to smaller guarded communities and like the fear of the other. And that's something that, you know, it's been going on for a really long time in, in those ideas. You, you don't think they're actually, the, the actual uh, attempts to do these things never really happen, but people get really excited about doing those things. And they, um, and you kind of see that now with different ideas for different kind of beyond gated communities, almost like fortresses that people are gonna live in, kind of detached from the rest of society. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, it's, when I see things like that, I, you know, it kind of makes me think like, um, yeah, I'm not I'm totally onto something here. I mean, who knows what, but. <laughs> or, or we're going backwards to the Middle Ages. Oh, no, mm -hmm. I just meant, yeah, no, we are going backwards to the Middle Ages. I meant just, well, I'm onto something with his book. No. <laughs> I was thinking in relation to news stories like that, whenever I've seen, the only, the only instances I can think of like that for my personal stuff is when reality has made me look like an asshole. Like, I would always tell people that I grew up in Seattle here, and I was like, I was really boring, so I just sat around and drew comics all day and everything. And that was right when Seattle got their superhero, like Phoenix Jones. And so I told people about this, like, uh, boring suburb city, and they're like, oh, the place with the superhero. That must have sucked. <laughs> we, we, we've got time for uh, one more question, then we need to wrap up. Hi, uh, I was just curious, there are more and more now, it seems like they're, we're getting these genre mashups or these genre kind of breaking. Uh, are there any genres you'd like to see more of kind of mushed together or? Anyone? No. no. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's so much that can be done, and it's great to see what happens when you, when you combine any two things. Um, uh, I've, I've got a friend, uh, this guy named Sean Thomas, who works on like Boondocks and um, Black Dynamite, and, and he's a guy who grew up in Brooklyn um, on j just a steady diet of Japanese animation, and then wanted to do it so bad that he moved to Korea to learn how to animate there. And him growing up like just embedded in hip hop culture and then mixing it with like the Korean culture. I really mm. like to see how things have completely, uh, things that you never expected to connect to jump together and create an entirely new thing. And I think anything with genres, you take like, you know, you take a romance horror and you do it in your own way and it's, it's, it's creating something new and that's really exciting. Mm. And it's, it's, that's a great thing about, about doing fiction is you can, you don't have to limit yourself to saying this is a film noir thing and these are the rules, you can just be like, you know, and here's a robot dinosaur. We need more science fiction sitcoms. <laughs> Thanks for uh, coming out today and uh, give a round of applause to the folks up here. And I have three copies of Elephant Man if you want to come up and grab one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Welcome, so yeah. Um, you know what? Come to the booth.